the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, hanging by a thread. At 9.15 on the morning of May 5th, 1947, the telephone rang in the sheriff's office in the little town of Finney, Texas. Sheriff Hanson answered it. Sheriff's office, Hanson speaking. Sheriff, this is George Hawks. How are you, George? What can I do for you? Nothing now. Nobody can. Uh, how's that? I just called to tell you I'm going to kill myself. What did you say? You heard me. It'll take you 20 minutes to get out to my place. By that time, I'll be dead. Now, now, wait a, wait a minute, George. What? Hello? Hello? George? Uh, operator? Operator? Yes, sir? Oh, this is the sheriff. That caller just came in here. Where was it from? One moment, Sheriff. Uh, if this is someone's idea of a practical... Hello, general... Sheriff? Yes? Yeah. That call was placed from 317 out on Gum Creek Road, the residence of Mr. George Hall. <laughs> Sheriff raced out to the Hawks Ranch and found George Hawks dead, hanging in the barn. Then he made another discovery which prompted him to put in a call to the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case and drove to the Hawks Ranch to meet Sheriff Hanson. Jace, am I glad to see you. Howdy, Sheriff. It's been a long time. Yeah, a month of Sundays. I hope I didn't call you down here for nothing, Jace, but this looks mighty fishy to me. So I want you to take a look at the body. Hasn't been taken down yet? No, I put in a call to the coroner, but he was out somewhere. I left a message for him to come out here as soon as they could locate him. How'd you find out about the body, Sheriff? I got a phone call, Jace, about 9.15. Said it was George Hawks and he was going to kill himself. I thought maybe it was some joker, so I traced the call. And? It came from here all right. So I drove out fast as I could, but George was dead. Hanging by the neck in the barn. No pulse. Body's still warm. Sheriff, I know you didn't call me down here to investigate a routine suicide. What's the catch? Well, I'm getting to that. Come in the barn. This is just the way he was when I found him. You notice that's a wire he's hanging from, not a rope. Yeah. Cut off the clothesline, probably. Yeah. How do you know? Guest. I saw the clothesline had been cut, part of a dragon on the ground in the yard. <laughs> you rangers don't miss much, do you? Not if we can help it, Sheriff. Well, I want to show you something I found. Look at this, right under the body. Mm, it's an oil drum. Right. And the exact position I found it in, on its side. Now you'll notice, Jace, that... It's the only thing near enough that George could have stood on while he put the wire around his neck. Here's the rim marks where it stood on the straw before it was tipped over. Yeah, only he didn't stand on it. Look at this end of the drum. Thick with dust. Hmm. Now look at the other end. Dusty, too. Jace is not a sign of a footprint on either end of this oil drum. You're right, Sheriff. He couldn't have climbed up in the loft and jumped, or that wire would have taken his head off. Yeah, that's what I figured, and that's why I called you. What about fingerprints? Nope. Oh, couldn't find any, just a few smears. What does it spell to you, Jace? Just one word, and an unpleasant one. Murder. Murder. <laughs> 
pictures of the body, and we took down the broken clothesline and nosed around for more evidence. The sheriff went up to look over the house while I combed the barn. How'd you make out up at the house, Sheriff? Nothing, Chase. Absolutely nothing. No note from George. Everything tidy. No sign of a struggle. Funny nobody's around. Who would be ordinarily? His wife, Millie. From one of the hands. He had two men working for him last I heard. How are you coming, Jace? I found a couple of things, but not the thing I want. What's that? The tool that was used to cut the wire he's hanging on. All I found in the barn here was this pair of rusty pliers. Well, couldn't they have been used to cut it? No, Sheriff, they wouldn't cut butter. Mm -hmm. Besides, the cut's too clean. How about footprints? No luck yet. But I think I've found what the killer stood on to string the body up. What? The stepladder. I found it under the tool bench. Been used lately. Marks in the dust where it had been dragged out and then pushed back. Well, what are you fixing to do, Jace? Going up the ladder and take a look at the beam where the wire's looped over. Here, here, I'd better hold it for you. It's pretty rickety. Thanks. Find something? I think so. What is it, Jace? Look at this. Stuck on a splinter where the wire went over the beam. It's a piece of black thread. Yeah, black wool thread. <laughs> well, are you a string saver, Jace? In a case like this, yes. Let's take a look outside. Mm -hmm. What about a motive, Sheriff? For suicide or murder? Either. Uh, can't think of a one offhand. George was a pretty normal guy, happily married. Didn't have any enemies that I know of. How about those two hands you mentioned? Well, this new one, Brad Johnson, been working for George about six months. Only met him a couple of times. Seemed to be all right. In a quiet sort of way. And the other? <laughs> Old Tom. Oh, he's okay. Drinks a lot. George used to fire him regular and then take him back when he sobered up. There's no good footprints in the yard here. Nope. Ground's packed pretty hard. Oh, Sheriff, huh? Car coming up the house. Is that the corner? That? Uh... Well, no, that looks like... Well, sure, that's George Hawk's car. That's Millie driving it. Mrs. Hawks. Come on. We'll have to tell her, Sheriff. This is the only part of the job I really hate. Yeah, I know, Jace. Sheriff, what are you doing out this way? And... Well, morning, Mrs. Hawks. This is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, ma'am. Ranger? What's happened? What's the matter? I'm sorry to have to tell you, Millie. But George... Something happened to George? Yes. He's dead. Oh, no. no. Come on, oh, Mrs. No. Hawks. We'll take you to the house. No. I, I can't believe he'd do it. Mrs. Hawks. When did you last see your husband? Just a few hours ago at breakfast. How did he appear at breakfast? I mean, was anything wrong? Was he upset about anything? Well, yes, there was a big fight at breakfast. I'd never seen George get to my head. A fight? Between you and your husband? Well, all four of us went on it. Old Tom and Brad was there, too. They're the hired hands. How did it start? I cooked breakfast for the four of us, like I always do. Old Tom was late, so we'd started to eat. When we were about through, old Tom came staggering in. He was half drunk. Again, huh? Yes, Sheriff, again. Then he and George had this big row, and George fired him for being drunk. Go on. Old Tom was fighting mad. He gets mean when he's been drinking. He started making all kinds of wild accusations. What kind of accusations, Mrs. Hawks? Lies, Ranger. All of them lies. He said he wouldn't have been drunk if Brad hadn't bought liquor for him. Brad? Well, that's what he claimed. Said Brad got him drunk on purpose, so he... Oh, it was awful. So he could what? Well, it's a lie, Ranger. It... What did he say, Mrs. Hawks? Well, old Tom said to Brad, I wouldn't be drunk if you didn't buy me this stuff. You're always trying to get me out of the way so I won't see you... So I won't see you playing up to the boss's wife. Then what happened? Well, Tom left, and my husband started swearing and threatening Brad, accusing him of what Tom said. Brad said it was a lie, and then George threw some money in his face and told him to get off the place that he was fired, too. What did Brad do? I thought for a minute he was going to hit George, but he didn't. 
He went outside, and a few minutes later, I heard his car start, and he drove away. By this time, George was in a terrible rage. He even threatened to kill me. So I grabbed the car keys and ran. Did he ask you where you were going? Yes, he did, Ranger. And I told him I was going in town to see Mr. Harris, the lawyer, to see about getting a divorce. What time did you leave? About 8.30. Ranger, you said you found him hanging in the barn. Well, if it was suicide, why are you asking me all these questions? Because I don't think it was suicide, Mrs. Hawks. I think it was murder. <laughs> After the coroner and the doctor arrived, the sheriff borrowed a horse from the corral. I got charcoal out of the trailer, and we headed for Tom's shack up in the hills. There it is, Chase, just around those rocks. That Tom's horse, Sheriff? Grazing out back? Yep. He's around someplace. Up, charcoal. Yep. I just can't see old Tom as a killer, Jace. He ain't the type. Huntsville's full of them, Sheriff. Killers who aren't the type. Oh, 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 oh charcoal. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Let's try the front door. Okay. All right, Tom. Open up. He's not here, Jace. I can see through the window. Shack's empty. <laughs> what the... Somebody's shooting close by. Maybe Tom. That shot came from back up in that draw. Come on, Sheriff. There he is. Back by that clump of trees. Is that Tom? Sure is. Hey, he's running toward the trees. Hold it, Tom. There we are. I'll put one over his head. Ah. Yeah, he's starving. See what he's wearing, Jace? Yeah. Black sweater. Now, what's all the commotion? All right, Tom. Throw down that rifle. Sure. Sure, Ranger. But, uh, what for? Why didn't you stop when I told you to? Well, to tell the truth, Ranger, I didn't hear you. I'm kind of deaf. I heard you shot, though. Yeah, that's right, Jace. He's hard of hearing. What's that, sir? Oh, never mind. Why'd you shoot at us, Tom? Shoot at you? Why, I never did no such thing. What were you doing then? Ain't no law against a man killing himself a rabbit for supper. All right. Get his rifle, Sheriff. Let's go. Huh? Where to? To your shack first. We're going to have a long talk about George Hawks. <laughs> Tell you, Ranger, I didn't know George was dead until you told me a minute ago. Uh, what call would I have to kill him? If he was killed, he was my friend. You don't seem very clear about what happened this morning, Tom. Well, I... I was a bit foggy. I had me a couple of nips. But I do remember George getting mad and firing me. What happened after that? Well, I took a few more out of the bottle in my saddlebag. I don't remember much after that. I must have rode up here and fell asleep. Woke up a while ago. I was hungry and I went out to get me a rabbit. Tell me, Tom. Do you often draw a blank when you've been drinking? Do, do I what, Ranger? Have a blank space. Do things you don't remember anything about later. Oh, I suppose I have once or two. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do it. I couldn't have killed George. He was my friend. These your wire cutters on the table, Tom? Oh, yeah, they are. I'll take them. And I think you'd better come along to town with us. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson at our new Sunday time. We hope that our many friends who have listened to us at the earlier hour will continue to be with us each Sunday. And for those of you who are hearing our program for the first time, we extend a warm and cordial welcome and invite you to be with us each Sunday from now on. And now we continue with tonight's case, Hanging by a Thread, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> finger was pointing straight at Tom. When we got back to the Hawks Ranch, there was a man in the back lot feeding the hogs. It was Brad Johnson, the third witness at the breakfast fight. While the sheriff took Tom into town, I got Brad's version of what happened. And then he threw the money in my face, Ranger. Thirty dollars. Told me I was fired. I wanted to hit him, but I didn't. Then what, Brad? Then I got my duffel bag, threw it in my car, and drove off. Where'd you go? To Finney. 
drove around town for a few minutes, and then I went to the White Spot Cafe and had a cup of coffee. What time was this? When I was in the cafe? Oh, about 9.30, I guess. Why'd you come back here? Well, somebody in town said that George had killed herself and that the coroner was on his way out here. So? Well, I figured if it was true, there wouldn't be anybody to do the chores. He fired old Tom, too. And Mrs. Hawks always treated me so friendly. Well, so I come out to do what I could. Yeah, very nice of you. Tell me, Brad, is there anything between you and Mrs. Hawks? No, sir. That's a lie, Ranger. Never even spoke to each other except at mealtimes or say good morning. What are you planning to do now? Well, I don't know. Help Mrs. Hawks till she can get somebody, I reckon. I see. Well, I gotta be moseying along. Oh, uh, don't leave town without letting me know. Oh, I, I won't, Ranger. I'll be around. got the evidence off to Austin and then went to the White Spot Cafe. Brad had been seen there at 9.30, and Mrs. Hawks had been with her lawyer half an hour before. I radioed headquarters that I was staying over in Finney, and about 9 that night, I got a phone call. Hello? Jace, Captain Stinson. I've got the report on that stuff you sent in today. You got a pencil? I sure have, Captain. Shoot. On that black wool sweater, the thread you sent in the envelope matched all right. It's definitely off the sweater. How about the wire cutters? I'm afraid I got a disappointment for you there, Jase. They couldn't get a match. I'm afraid the murder wire wasn't cut with the tool you sent. Are you sure, Captain? The boys in the lab are. They made sample cuts with every millimeter of those blades and couldn't match up a single one with a murder wire. Oh. What kind of a fix does that put you in, Jase? I'm not sure. Well, thanks, Captain. I'll keep in touch with you. All right, Jase. Good luck. going to need more than luck. Things were really getting tangled up. It was about 4 a.m. when I finally dozed off trying to dope it out. Then at 8.30, I met the sheriff in his office. Well, you look like you've been through the ring at Jay's. Hotel bed's too hard for you. No, but I didn't get much sleep trying to figure this Hawks thing out. Looks like we'll have to let old Tom go, Sheriff. Why? What's up? The lab says Tom's cutters didn't cut that wire. They didn't? No. Of course, old Tom could have used other cutters, but in his stupor, I doubt if he'd be that clever. Uh, Well, I hate to complicate things more than they are, Jase. What do you mean? Karna called a little while ago. He sent in his report over with one of my deputies. Should have been here by now. His verdict is suicide. Suicide? That doesn't make sense. Well, apparently it does to him. We'll know when the report gets here. Yeah. George Hawks, deceased. Climbed up a stepladder, put a wire around his neck, and then placed the ladder neatly under a workbench 12 feet away. Mm-hmm. My dusty oil drum snarling things up, Jason. Considerable. Morning, Sheriff. Mm. Howdy, Ranger. Hi. Morning, Joe. Did you get it? Yep. I had to wait while the coroner signed it. Here it is. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Anything more I can do, Sheriff? Uh, no, not right now. Well, I'll go get me some breakfast then. Uh, let's see. No marks of violence on the victim's body. Autopsy disclosed no brain injury. Death probably caused by strangulation. Coroner's conclusion, suicide. Signed, G. Parker Coroner. Hmm? There it is, Jace. It couldn't be. No, here's something from the doctor. I examined the body at 11.30 a.m., it is my opinion the death occurred approximately three hours previously. I'm in... Hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Well, what is it? That'd make it about 8.30 when George died. What time did you say he called you? At 9.15. Great suffering. Sheriff, are you sure it was George who called? Well, now that you mention it, I, I'm not sure. Said he was George. Or could it have been somebody else? Yeah, I suppose so. It's beginning to piece together, Sheriff. Whoever it was could have killed George, then called you and tried to sound like him. To establish an alibi. Exactly. And then pop up someplace else a few minutes later. Like the White Spot Cafe. I'll call you later. Now, where are you going, Chase? Back to the Hawks Ranch. <laughs> When I pulled up to the ranch, Brad Johnson was running water into the big trough near the barn. Well, hi, Ranger. What brings you out this way? I want to talk to Mrs. Hawks. We're releasing Tom. Coroner's report came in a few minutes ago. Suicide. Is she around? Why, sure, she's up in the house. Okay. 
Oh, I... I just happened to think. Charcoal, my horse here in the trailer, hasn't had a square meal since I left headquarters yesterday. Is there some hay around that I could give him? Why, sure, Ranger. Some fresh bale just inside the barn there helps sell. Thanks. I'll be glad to pay for it. No, no, forget it. I'm sure Mrs. Hawks wouldn't mind. Oh, uh, have you got something to open one with? Why, sure. Here. Here's my cutters. I took the cutters into the barn and made some cuts on a wire sample. After I gave the cutters back to Brad and fed charcoal, I spoke briefly with Mrs. Hawks, and then I tore out for the lab in Austin. By one o'clock, I got the results. Here it is, Jace. Take a look. The wires match, Johnny? See for yourself. That dual microscope never lied to me yet. The left one's the murder wire. The one on the right is one of the samples you brought in. That's it. Well, look at those striations. It's a perfect match. Thanks, Johnny. Take care of this stuff. Got to get back to Finney pronto. Oh, will you do me a favor? Sure, Jace. Call the sheriff at Finney. Tell him I'm on my way and I got something hot. I'll be there in two hours. Well, Jace, you sure made good time. What'd you find out? We got positive proof the murder wire was cut with Brad Johnson's cutters. Brad's? You gonna pick him up? Not right yet, Sheriff. Why not? We only know that Brad's cutters were used. We don't know he used them. We got to be sure. What are your plans, Jace? I've been thinking. Those stories that Mrs. Hawks and Brad told me, they were alike, all right. Too much alike. What do you mean? A couple of times they used the exact phrases. Mm -hmm. What about Tom and the black thread? We'll keep an eye on him, but I think he's clean. He could have caught his sleeve on that beam doing anything, pitching hay or anything. Yeah, he could have. Well, uh, what do we do now? We've got to catch him alone, Brad and Mrs. Hawks. When they don't know anybody's around, we got to hear what they say to each other. Maybe after the funeral. It's this afternoon, 4 o'clock. You know where it's being held, Sheriff? Sure, out of the ranch. It'll be a graveside ceremony. Where's the cemetery? Clear over on the other side of town from the Hawks' place. It'll take them a while to get over there and back. Sheriff, while they're at the cemetery, you and I are going to the ranch and fix up a little surprise. <laughs> Be all right for that one, behind the window shade. Why three microphones, Jace? Wouldn't one do? Not if they wander around the house while they're talking, Sheriff. I want to hear everything. Yeah, but how do you know that Brad and Mrs. Hawks will talk? How do you know they'll even come into the house? I don't know, Sheriff. I'm guessing. And my guess is that after the funeral's over, somebody's going to let his hair down. Hey, it's almost five, Jace. They'll be coming back soon. I'm finished in here, Sheriff. Now all we have to do is string the wire to the stakeout. Come on. hid in my car in a lane down the road and set up our equipment at a clump of trees close to the house. Three neighbors' cars drove up, then Brad's. We watched him as he fed the stock. About sundown, the last of the guests left the house. There go the last of them, Sheriff. Can you see Brad? He's been in the barn the last few minutes. Hmm. There he is, Jace, heading for the house. Good. Put on your earphones, Sheriff. I want you to hear this, too. There he goes, up on the porch. Yeah. Shh. Brad. Oh, Brad. Now, come here, baby. Oh, Brad, I'm so tired. I'm scared. Ain't nothing to be scared about, baby. Everything worked out fine. Oh, take me away with you, Brad, now, tonight. Millie, I can't do that. You know it. Why not? Why can't you? The plan, baby. We gotta follow the plan. Now look, if we went away together now, there'd never us no time. We gotta let it go. Fred, I can't spend another night in this house, not alone. I can keep seeing his face. You holding him. That look of his when I put the pillow over his face, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I told you to shut up. Look, you, I put a lot of hard work on us. My alibi's got him clear off the trail, and I'm not gonna let him get back on, you hear? All right, Sheriff. I've heard enough. Let's take them. You cover the back, Sheriff. I'll take the front. Okay, Jace. Right right. All right, in there. Open up. Right. Ranger Pearson, open up. What do you want? You know what I want, Brad Johnson. Well, he's not here. I know different. Okay, Sheriff, let's search the house. All right, Jace. I don't know what this is all about. You'll find out. 
found the kitchen, Jace. All right, Sheriff, work this way. Granger, what's the meaning of this? He's not in the back of the house, Jace. Maybe he's... What was that? He was upstairs, Sheriff. Sounds like he jumped from up there. Come on. Don't see him. He didn't run for his car. Couldn't have gone far. Maybe he hit for the highway. That's... What's that? Chickens in the barn. Something scared him, and I think I know what. Come on. If we play this right, we've got him trapped. I know you're in there, Brad. Come on out. All right. Dark as pitch in there, Jace. Turn on your flashlight, Sheriff. Take the other side. I'll look behind those. Okay. Sheriff, pitchfork threw it from the loft. He hit me. You hurt bad? Don't think so. My shoulder. Here, give me your flashlight, Sheriff. All right, Brad. I'm coming up. No, no, don't come up. I'm coming down. Come out where we can see you then. With your hands up. Jace, he's jumping. No! Oh! Oh! Jace, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I fell on his back, hit his head when I hit him. Is he dead? No. No, Sheriff, he's not dead. But I can't say he won't be, though, when the state gets through with him. After Mildred Hawks turned state's witness, Brad Johnson confessed to the murder of his employer. For her part in the crime, Mildred Hawks received a sentence of 50 years in a women's prison at Huntsville. Johnson's sentence, death in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. While most of the mail that comes to us here at Tales of the Texas Rangers is written by grown-ups, the youngsters have their questions, too. Tonight, I'd like to read you a postcard from a boy in Newark, New Jersey. It says, Dear Mr. McRae, I am nine years old. Me and my friend Tony was talking about being Texas Rangers when we grow up. How do you go about getting that job? Your friend, Tommy Cook. Well, Tommy, a lot of people have asked us that same question recently, and I guess maybe it's high time for us to tell them. First, a ranger has to serve at least 10 years as an outstanding police officer. Then he may compete with others for the job. If he's selected, he works under the wing of a ranger captain for at least six months, and then he's put out in the field with other seasoned rangers for a year and a half. By this time, he is, or he isn't, a true Texas Ranger. And Tommy, your card's being sent to Colonel Homer Garrison, Jr., chief of the Texas Rangers. Good luck. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trent. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Byron Kane, Betty Lou Gerson, Jeff Corey, and Wally Mayer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Andrew McBroom, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tuesday nights are bright with comedy on NBC. Start off the evening with Baby Snooks. Hear Fibber McGee and Molly of 79 Wistful Vista. Listen as Art Linkletter proves that people are funny and laugh with Bob Hope and his gang. It's truly fine entertainment every Tuesday night. So be sure to listen for Baby Snooks, Fibber McGee and Molly, People Are Funny, and Bob Hope.